Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I hope the report will be finished. We still learn and we'll still update and still include new things in the report we are preparing for PSA. Um, is this uh, uh, yours? Yeah. Yours, mine, thank you. Okay, who is growing old gracefully? I, I'm not, I, I wear glasses and I get gray hair. Um, you keep track of time, Tron, I'll talk. Um, Forcebsi is uh, a company, six years old. This is our playground. We cover everything from floating wind turbines which is extremely complex and dynamic to real steel catene risers, uh, well added systems and uh, risers, and for sure a lot on flexibles and unbonded pipes and bonded pipes. Um, the reason I'm invited here is probably that we have worked quite hard for quite some time to try to understand what's going on inside the, the pipe wall of a riser. So in total, uh, for Subsea have investigated uh, nearly 30,000 meters of used risers from taken out from uh, operation and, and uh, investigated in detail. Not alone, but, uh, but uh, we've been responsible for the receival and the initial investigations on, on uh, what's going on in there. Cover materials uh, of different kinds, for sure intact and damaged pipes, uh, the uh, intact pipe is just as important to understand why is this pipe doing well with this exposure it has seen and another pipe made the same month in the factory have suffered some problems. So we have covered the most of our, ex of our experiences for sure from Norway but also West Africa, Netherlands and UK. Um, we have some very good helpers in marine tech, Sintef, DNV, uh, EFI, and North Sea Base, where we receive all the risers coming in. And for sure, uh, without operators uh, supporting us, giving us all this work, uh, and the vendors supplying information that we need for this work. Um, we are 32 engineers, uh, full time on flexibles in four subsea. Um, collected uh, about 400 years of flexible riser experience so far. Uh, what we try to do, all the young engineers coming into our company uh, are encouraged to go offshore and get used to what's going on in the reality. And uh, they have so far covered about uh, 1,000 analyst tests and about 500 uh, vent gas samples. Um, and what have you learned from that? And that uh, the most important learning so far is that it's still still a long way to do to, to go before we can see that we know everything about uh, flexibles. Um, and we have, should mention also that we have looked into uh, or, or participating in uh, a few in a few GIPs. The, for uh, focus uh, is uh, something that we hope to will end up in a revision of the TR2, uh, API 17 TR2. Uh, I don't know if that will be called TR3 or 2B or 2.2, revision 2. Okay. Um, <coughs> and uh, we're also running a GIP with the Marine Tech on safe and cost effective operation of flexible pipes where we have looked into the specification of life extension and try to set up a consistent way of doing it with the basis that Trun just showed. So let's start looking at some uh, uh, things on the Norwegian shelf riser in incident statistics. I try to go a little bit deeper than the introduction in those things. Um, look into some challenges and opportunities for the future and uh, trying to at least give some leads where to go uh, on, on different strategies. Uh, we don't provide the full strategies, but give some insight in strategies that are being used and strategies that might, might be important for, for the years coming. Uh, the um, Norwegian shelf have, as previously said, dominated by Statoil. 
78% uh, of all the risers uh, out there is statoil operated. Uh, um, Exxon Mobil 6% uh, at the second biggest, and then, then a few on 4%. So it's dominated by Statoil, and um, they have a lot of experience. And also, the other companies uh, are uh, gaining valuable experience in this context. Uh, what's happening up north is interesting because uh, if we uh, fight with low temperatures south North Sea, I think uh, uh, polyamides and uh, low temperature far up north could be even more challenging. So um, the development of the flexible risers uh, in uh, Norwegian waters uh, started uh, early, I think 85, 86 or something like that, with a few static lines uh, uh, connecting uh, uh, subsea equipment. Um, and uh, I think uh, from some, some time uh, early 90s until about the year 2000 or 2001, it was a rapid growth. So all the float developments since Veslefrik have been really dependent upon uh, uh, flexible risers and the, the enabling technology. Without that technology available, it would not be possible to have this growth in oil production in Norway. Uh, fixed platforms tend to be very expensive uh, when water depth passes to 300 meters. So uh, I think it was briefly mentioned that the PSI is, is uh, collecting uh, information on uh, um, uh, incidents on flexible pipes. Uh, the database is called CODAM uh, and um, it's managed by PSA and it collects data reported uh, from the operators. The data covers from mid uh, 70s and flexible uh, risers and, and uh, pipelines are uh, really structured from about 1995 when, when uh, things are picking up in the Norwegian sector. Um, it is focused on uh, personal risk. Uh, that's, that's maybe I think, the argument to um, the operators that if it's involved personal risk, it should be reported. Um, I claim it is a potential for improvement. Uh, I discussed with PSA, who is in charge of that improvement or should be in charge of that improvement. I, I, my opinion is that it's, uh, PSA is probably the only body th that can do something and for enforce sharing of that information and enforce the reporting into the database and also share that. So the, the link is there and it's uh, regularly updated. Um, so you, you can still go in there and look at that information. Uh, and gives you a view of what's going on. Uh, we've been fortunate to have some more details uh, on, on some of this information, but it should also, the public version should cover quite a bit uh, of information on what's going on. So summing up the statistics, I'm, I'm not sure uh, exactly why we had some difference in the numbers, but we have actually in four subsea two databases. It's the CODAM as is, and we have added what we know that uh, the authorities doesn't know, which is uh, a sad story in itself, but okay. Um, the major incidents is the one that were focused in the introduction, and I focus also on the major incidents. And the major incident could typically be uh, what's listed here, uh, observation of a damaged outer sheet, uh, coating in the rising, uh, uh, Damage after coating in the in the guide tube, uh, and uh, it's in the splash zone area or just below the splash zone inside uh, the guide tube. Uh, and testing uh, confirmed it's a leak, and, uh, and the cracks in the outer sheet is seen on the video. Uh, for those of you that is uh, remember a few years back, I think uh, um, this is fairly obvious that it's a uh, Christine riser uh, where the external sheet is weird that is published by Statoil. So 
everybody. That's a typical major issue. It could be a leak, but this is also, let's say, a typical major uh, incident. So uh, a major incident typically requires some fairly urgent actions taken, and I think uh, Statoil took some urgent actions on Christian and, and mm, say, um, buyed some time and, uh, and had a replacement program in there fairly soon. So the most important uh, incidents is for sure carcass incidents. And what, what the, that is, is uh, a lot of carcass collapses, um, a fair amount of pullouts of the PVDF uh, interaction pulls out uh, the carcass from the end fitting. That is also published uh, from last Omae by Statoil. Um, fairly detailed presentation there, and it will be followed up by a set of more details on the coming Omae uh, in uh, San Francisco in June. Um, uh, it have been also some actual uh, failures on hydrate blocking uh, in Norway, that hydrates form inside the carcass during a shutdown uh, and during a startup or a test or, or some, some um, pressure incident. It uh, gets a differential pressure over uh, the hydrate or the blocking uh, that can tear off uh, the carcass. I think uh, Statoil also published a few photos where you clearly see that the, the carcass is just snapping off uh, and, and disappearing uh, up or down in the, in the rising. Uh, sand erosion has been uh, uh, a problem, at least for some types of topside jumpers, uh, um, but it's seen. And uh, we also, have, I think, have one or two incidents of carcass fatigue from uh, fabrication irregularities. So the carcass gets a bit too tight and bending it uh, ends up in a fatigue issue and further develops and uh, into a, a leak eventually that, uh, that fatigue. Uh, and the uh, wear incident is the bell mount and the guide tube wear mentioned on the previous slide. Um, somewhere against interfacing structures and ancillary equipment. Uh, seabed uh, touchdown, as illustrated on the photo on the, uh, on the bottom right there, um, and also of internal wear. When we open up the risers and look at the dynamic sections, uh, it's, a f it, it's uh, quite a bit of wear inside between the tape layers and uh, the wires and the uh, anti-bird cage uh, tape, so the dynamic areas where you have uh, contact forces uh, tends to wear out the layers. And uh, one th good thing is that it seems like the wires are okay, but uh, all the other layers, uh, they, they don't cope well with the high dynamics, high contact forces. Uh, aging <coughs> is a problem that we've seen uh, I think uh, in the early days of the PA11 and the high temperature uh, water content uh, problems, but this uh, latest year it's more uh, related to um, external sheets and shielding uh, within the trench or under bending stiffeners or bend restrictors that it's uh, the uh, temperature is higher than predicted uh, or higher than the material can take. So when you sum up the incidents and the number of risers in operation, we end up in a curve which is, uh, yeah, we can see some hope. <laughs> it's, uh, the gradient is, is uh, uh, lower the last four years than the first five years. But we see a trend uh, that we, from this curve, would expect about five major incidents per rise a year in operation. No, per, 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 no, that's wrong, per full year. Yeah, so it's 1.6% per percent per rise a year. So, sorry, that was wrong. Um, which uh, some of us think is a bit too high because it's uh, all of these major incidents have a potential risk for uh, uh, personal risk and also uh, economically and, and environmentally. 
And further, when we sum up, we I think I haven't really been able to count all the re rise replacements, but I'm convinced it's more than 80, and I think we heard 80 to 100. I think 100 is probably the mo a more correct number of totally number of risers that have been in operation, have been damaged, or and then replaced afterwards. Um, so uh, some, somewhere around uh, 30 of these risers are replaced uh, due to risk assessment. It's not a, a failure that uh, we're threatening the integrity uh, directly, but uh, in retrospect, with the learning available, uh, with the history of the field, with the history of the risers, uh, 30, about 30, maybe 40 or 50, I'm not sure. But uh, at a fair bit is, uh, is replaced due to risk assessment. But um, indi indicative, we are talking about more than 25%, maybe about 30% of the risers in operation uh, as we speak have been replaced. Uh, very, very few of them uh, have uh, experienced their full predicted, original predicted uh, life. And so I think we can say that close to 30% is replaced before they reached their intended life, which uh, is quite disturbing. Um, the 60 major incidents, I'm not sure why we counted differently, but uh, uh, in my table I have 60 uh, major incidents from 95 to 2013. And, uh, and uh, 49 is reported into the database that are replaced. And I'm fairly sure that nearly all the other 11 that is claimed to be repaired is also replaced, but at a later stage. Which is some of the things that I, I think needs to be uh, better reported. That when the operator find in retrospect that something we was reported to have failed and planned to repaired, to be repaired when that is replaced afterwards. It's not really a new incident, but it's a new and important information related to the first incident. And that should be reported for completeness and better understanding of what's going on. And for sure, a lot of flow lines and topside jumpers are replaced and it's not reported anywhere. So it's just something that we pick up and take notes. Um, so is this sad story really uh, uh, something specific for Norway? And partly yes, partly no. And I think uh, in general terms, it's no better elsewhere. It's still challenges el elsewhere with different risers, different uh, uh, flexible flow lines. Uh, and it's just illustrated by some pictures I've uh, borrowed from uh, sources. And then, okay, that's the picture. It's uh, about 30% of the risers in operations in Norway have been changed before they reach their intended life. And uh, uh, what can we do about it? And m maybe, uh, I don't have the full answer. I introduced for Subsi by saying that the most important things we've learned after investigating 30,000 meter used riser is that we still have a long, long way to go before we can really call those experts in this field. So the time-driven degradation processes uh, is related to polymer aging uh, and wear, uh, corrosion and fatigue. And how are we on the time? We have about 10, 12 minutes left. Okay, then I think I'll just uh, jump on and say that uh, the, <laughs> the presentation will be available. Uh, but this time-driven uh, degradation process is very important to understand when things are growing old. Um, and uh, as understanding increases, uh, we have to be better on how to predict this degradation and how to monitor what's going on. Um, we skip this one. Uh, and um, one important thing that is happening now is that the toolbox is growing. We get more tools. Uh, uh, you're happy, maps, about magnetic stress measurements. 
I don't know if that's a trade name or a, a method name, but um, I try to list all the inspection and testing tools and, and methods available. And uh, the, com the, the big trend as we speak is continuous monitoring. And we've seen some very clear indications uh, that continuous monitoring can uh, be very useful in limiting consequences of an emerging leak. Uh, and I think that's probably one big and important reason for thinking about continuous monitoring, to be able to uh, recognize uh, a behavior or a, um, a trend that uh, indicates a leak coming in a few days or a few months. But it's still quite a bit to, to do in this field. And I think um, all of you that work with flexible risers um, have experienced the difficulties of digging up old information. I think I've discussed with quite a few of you where can we find a data sheet for this? Do we have any incidents reported during the installation which might be important for the assessment we're doing on life extension? So information management is extremely important. And um, for subs, you have developed something for Shell, which is quite good. We also use on all the systems internally for keeping track of all the information we have on the RISIP. Um, and that's very useful because when we were discussing uh, a week ago about some incidents in West Africa, it was a question about uh, is the, do we know if these analysts have been dry or water filled uh, over the last years? And uh, the question uh, we quickly answered because we had a ROV video in our systems that, uh, that discovered the external sheet damage in 2006. So it was not really a question if the analyst is wet or dry because we had evidence of a leaking an analyst on tape from 2006. So another thing which is completely different but it's still a challenge uh, this uh, year, um, the UN report on claim climate change uh, concluded with medium confidence. So I, I think that's a term that we can see it's fairly certain. <laughs> uh, that the wave height, average wave height in North Atlantic is uh, increasing. And it's increasing uh, about half a meter over a typical lifetime of a riser. So South and North Sea uh, in the UK areas, probably uh, the um, uh, average significant wave height over a full year is below two meters. And if it increases by half a meter over 25 year, that's important for fatigue calculation and have to be taken into account when you do life extension. Uh, a similar study in Norwegian uh, waters focused not on the average and the fatigue uh, cases, but on the extremes, and it varies. South and North Sea and, and uh, North Norwegian Sea is, is inconclusive, uh, and the curve uh, down there to the right is taken from an area close to Snorre Gullfax area. And it concludes that the extremes are increasing, and that's important to take into account when we're discussing about conservatism in what we have seen before, it might not in the next 25 years or 20 years uh, show to be that conservative. And when we look at strategies, uh, uh, I think we, I'll, I'll mention just the headlines here. And uh, I think we all know these strategies uh, or at least some analog examples. But learn to live with reality is something that uh, I think is quickly, uh, 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 the operators quickly move away from that for some reasons. I, I think it would be benefiting the safety and the economy to really understand why is this riser failing and really take on board the consequence of that. That might be that the procedures have to be changed, it have to be uh, different things uh, implemented. 
replacing risers. It's uh, the story about my mother that we're annoyed of the garden hose leaking every 10 years. She suggested that this strategy for me about uh, 50, uh, nearly 50, 45 years ago, uh, said, okay, why not buy a new gar garden hose every five years and get rid of the problem that appears. Uh, and that strategy is used by some operators. Uh, uh, not too many because it's quite uh, expensive to replace risers. Uh, but the new trend uh, now is condition-based integrity management. And that's uh, interesting <laughs> and have a large potential, but it also requires an uh, awful lot of homework beca because you need to do a lot of homework to understand and, and um, really get the benefit of this uh, condition-based monitoring. The learn to live with reality. I think on the DNV seminar I said I have had my, s the, my wife and I have been together for about uh, 26 years now. So that's an example of learn to live with reality. She still says, uh, why, <laughs> why do you say you're home in 10 minutes when it takes two hours? But she have learned to live with that. And uh, uh, I think uh, if you could consistently handle the uncertainties, in improve the operational procedure, and train the people, uh, and also um, modify the systems. If you talk about uh, pressure relief, I've uh, e heard many times that, okay, you say that you can, uh, with the valves on board, it's very uh, difficult to do the pressure relief in the way recommended to avoid collapse. Uh, and, uh, and one reaction could be, okay, we do as good as we can, and we know that we are uh, breaking the recommendation or not following the recommendation to avoid collapse. Another uh, alternative could be, okay, if we should save this riser, we really have to modify the system to cope with the best recommendation and understanding. And the willingness to do those changes are not there or very seldom there. Um, replace the gar garden hose every five years is a good idea, but it's quite expensive uh, if it's a yellow garden hose like this one uh, and not the one that you buy on the, on the shop next door. Uh, quite a few people not any of you, for sure, uh, run to failure. And take the calculated risk, do the assessment, and say that we can live with the consequences and run until it failed. We got a uh, question a few years back uh, asking us to do a uh, rep repair clamp for a riser that failed uh, in Far East. And we started uh, questioning what was, was wrong, and now the pipe was leaking. Then he said, uh, then the pressure sheet uh, uh, have a breach, and we were asked to repair the external sheet by a clamp. So we said, okay, uh, we don't uh, deliver clamps to repair against a pr uh, oil leak, uh, yeah, and I don't think any of the internal procedures in your company can allow you doing that. And then we quickly lost that job. And the, eventually the clamp was installed uh, and they produced with about five bars over pressure in that pipe. And uh, after two more months, uh, it failed again. And then I think they gave up. But uh, someone is running to failure and also claiming that the pipe is not failed as long as it can carry most of the oil from A to B. And this very strong trend uh, towards uh, condition-based integrity management. We're moving from yearly or uh, every second year uh, campaigns of visual inspection by ROV uh, and uh, analyst testing. And uh, uh, quickly moving over to online systems, which is uh, interesting. Uh, the ghost is coming in now. <laughs> and... Uh, 
this is very different from a machinery that used to have four mechanics going, taking care, ca taking note, checking the oil, uh, and moving to a condition-based online system. Saves a lot of money, saves a lot of time, but we are moving the other way. We are moving from simple uh, campaign-based systems over to online systems, and that requires a uh, lot of work on the degradation processes, how to process and analyze this uh, data flow, information management, uh, communication between onshore support, we and those people working offshore, and uh, don't underestimate the uh, onshore support needed when you start up uh, these systems. Are we running out of time? Okay. We'll take this one and we skip uh, Trun's last checklist. He's already seen it and objected everything there. <laughs> um, so, uh, should I dare to say uh, anything to the operator that you need to do? They'd probably have just as uh, good information of these things and the insight even better than any of us. But I think uh, we need to, to remind everyone that uh, the flexible rises is complex. Um, and uh, a you know, complex system needs competence and you need to be very aware of your uh, internal and external competence sources and uh, which gaps to be filled. Are we sufficiently good and to make an uh, expert systems with online monitoring for the people offshore? Uh, we, we have to focus on continuity so the, all the mistakes done 10 years ago is not repeated after 10 or 15 or 20 years. Uh, we will encourage uh, that you support uh, research and development because I think the, the biggest benefit is on the operator side to understand more and for sure sharing ex experience and, and practices and develop and implement strategies and really take uh, this uh, as a huge challenge. The PCI checklist is, I think the most important thing, and we can stop there, is I really encourage PSA to ask the questions. Because what we see by, because we assist the operators often when PSA have asked questions, is that that stimulates a lot of thinking, a lot of good processes uh, inside the, on the operator side if the difficult questions are asked and, and followed up. And I close it by quoting Kent Cavani, which used to be the big grand old man, and he still is, uh, uh, on flexible uh, risers, uh, heading the API uh, committees and ISO committees before Crashy took over. And he says, we should not expect we are safe because we are smart or nice, or I just added to that or work long hours because lots of us are doing and uh, we still have a way, a way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, very good. Uh, any questions from the audience? Okay, one at the back there. Rit is uh, coming with the microphone. Charlie Smith from Shell in Aberdeen. Um, just one question. Do we have any sort of information on how many riser or flexible pipe failures have been due to operating out with design parameters? No, but I can find out. Um, I used to show a picture from uh, uh, drag chain. Uh, with a water injection pipe that failed due to corrosion, but uh, which is not uh, obvious from that picture, is uh, it was uh, operated on average within the pressure limit. But when we looked at the peaks on the pressure, 
they were well above the design limit. So with some corrosion and peaks uh, above, pressure peaks above the design uh, recommendation, it failed. So yes, um, I think it's very few risers that are operated outside design temperature and design pressure. But uh, I think it's quite a few uh, or a, a, quite a number of risers that are operated outside additional uh, recommendation like pressure relief uh, gradients and, uh, and uh, fluctuations on pressure and temperature, which is not uh, uh, in the design data sheet, but it's additional learning that we try to, to implement in different ways. Okay, any more questions? Time for uh, one or two more. Hey, I'm Ove uh, Flatus from uh, BG. Uh, I just want to ask you about the design construction of the riser and you know the, the specification that the company providing because the reason I'm asking is that this happened back in 2005 I think in China on the Panyu field uh, <coughs> the field came on stream and uh, s about five months after the riser slipped out of the connection they lost the riser and the investigation indicated that the reason was they de they designed the riser too close to the to the to the temperature that they had been specified. The ro the reservoir came in a few degrees above the design. So I don't know if that could be the main reason. I never I never learned that, but that was they was we were told. So the question is, do we operate try to save money? and, uh, and uh, make some limitation on the design criteria. Uh, yes, I, th I think a good recommendation for the future would be to include uh, higher margins between uh, your required operating temperature, uh, your, uh, let's say, the peak, uh, peak uh, temperature and, and pressures and have larger margins between those and the pipe design. But um, I think it's uh, more temperature that um, concerns me than pressure, and it's more fluctuations up and down that uh, uh, disturbs me than, than the continuous high. I, I, I no often show a slide that um, indicates that the, the risers that are doing well how they, how do, which risers are doing well. And the risers doing well is stable production, no interrupts. And that could be fairly high pressure uh, and a reasonable temperature. Uh, but the general recommendation is to use our service wires and good margins on temperature and pressures and be having a system that can take the pressures up and down very slowly. Uh, everybody should remember that uh, po uh, the polyamides in uh, the riser is extremely different material from the steel. And the steel can respond very quickly and they have the same modulus uh, for quick changes. All the polyamides have very different modulus from uh, the rate of uh, strain. And that is very important to remember. Take it easy. It's, it's no need to rush this because it's a plastic bag you're carrying full of bottles. 